Welcome to all of you for joining us today for WASDA's new director network. We are going to be talking about superintendent evaluation today. So that's a big topic, probably more than we can fully cover in an hour, but I think we're, we have enough time today to really give you a good background on um, what a solid superintendent evaluation process looks like. And we have a couple of outstanding um, expert school board members here to share with you um, how to run this in a way that um, is based on growth for your superintendent and also supports positive student outcomes. So I would like to take a moment just to um, introduce ourselves in case uh, you haven't been part of the new director network yet. So um, your uh, leadership development team is here. My name is Tricia Lubach. I am the director of leadership development. Um, and Christine, do you wanna introduce yourself? Hey, good to see everyone. I'm the leadership development coordinator within our branch. And uh, like I said, it's great to see you guys. We're going to have a good time. And so leadership development really focuses on providing school board members across the state with resources, guidance, training, and support. Um, we're really here to um, help you be the best board member that you can be and uh, point you to resources that are helpful for your work. I um, have 19 years of school board experience myself, so I, I would like to say I've seen it all, but it's probably not true. I've seen a lot, and I've worked with a lot of different board members, So, um, and our two guest presenters today have as well and I will introduce them to you in a moment. They have a lot of valuable background as well. So let's take a look at kind of where the, um, the branches at WASDA overlap. So as I mentioned, Christine and I head up leadership development. The other two ways that we support you in your work are through um, the policy and legal branch and um, the strategic advocacy branch. And those of you who are here for a second or a third time have uh, probably seen um, either um, Marissa Rathbone, uh, the director of strategic advocacy who talked about positive productive advocacy as a school board member last week, last month. And um, before that, Abigail Westbrook, the director of policy and legal shared um, legal responsibilities for school board members. And if you missed any of those, please feel free to hop on the new director website um, because we have all of these webinars recorded. This is our fourth one. So we have three previous to that. <clears throat> this one will be um, recorded and um, up on the website by tomorrow. So if you want to, um, to take a look there or forward it on to one of your colleagues, feel free. Okay, so just a couple tips for having a good webinar today. Um, all of you look like you're ready to go today, and it looks like all of you have muted yourselves. We've got a bunch of experts here today. Good job, everyone. Um, cameras on or off is fine. I realize some of you are probably eating lunch in the middle of your work day, and that's no problem. So um, either way is just fine. Um, we are not going to take questions during the webinar in order to ensure that we can get through all of the information that we want to present for you today, but you are more than welcome to type questions into the Q&A box, and I recommend the Q&A, not the chat box. The Q&A box is a little bit easier for us to monitor. Feel free to just put questions in there as we go along. I know sometimes holding onto a question until the end makes it hard to remember what that is. So pop those in and um, I will help curate those for our presenters and ask them um, when we come to that segment. And then just one more reminder here, this, um, as I mentioned, the webinar is being recorded. So I want to make you aware of that. So let's go on to the next one, Amy. And i um, just going to tell you a little bit about what our topics are today. You can see them up here. First of all, just understanding why boards need to evaluate their superintendents. Uh, this is actually a primary role of yours as a school board member. Um, it's important legally to ensure that you are annually reviewing your, um, evaluating your superintendent. But it's also important to do it in a meaningful way that supports your superintendent growth. Um, supports your um, board superintendent uh, team relationship. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about um, the importance around that. And then Amy and Mary have some fantastic tools and supports um, to support you in this work because it can be an overwhelming job. And we want to make sure that uh, we make it as easy and, um, and effective for you as possible. So in the, this slide might look familiar to any of you who participated in board boot camp, uh, which we did at annual conference and then um, also provided in Spokane recently on the other side of the state. 
um, from where we held it uh, in November in Bellevue. So you can see among these six uh, areas of the uh, board responsibilities, this one falls right smack in the middle down below. Thanks for that arrow, Amy. That's really handy. <laughs> um, so hiring and, and evaluating your superintendent, very, very important. All of you know that hiring your important, your, uh, hiring your superintendent is one of the most important things a school board does. Evaluating is just as important because that's what keeps you and the superintendent on track and following your strategic plan. So let's dive in a little bit. I am really pleased to um, introduce and turn over the webinar to two really outstanding um, leadership consultants who have worked for WASDA for a long time. Um, both of them have school board experience, plus they do a lot of work for coaching and supporting uh, school board members and school board superintendent teams around the state. Um, Amy Cast, uh, and I'll let her share a little bit more information about herself, and Mary Furtakis are here with us today. They have a lot of experience around this area of superintendent evaluation. And so I will turn it over to the two of you now. Thank you both. Thank you, Tricia. Super helpful for, uh, for the quick little handoff there. Hello. As Tricia mentioned, my name is Amy Cast. I am a um, school board member in the North Shore School District, which straddles the north end of King County and the south end of Snohomish County. Been serving on my school board for um, 10 years and have been um, really enjoying the honor and privilege of supporting other school boards through working with the WASDA Leadership Consultant Group. So I'm really happy to talk to you about superintendent evaluation. This is a process that my board has had quite a journey on. And so um, I'm happy to share what we learned over those 10 years as we worked hard to really get it into a process that really helps everyone and trickles down to students. So Mary, do you want to say hello? Hello. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Mary Furtakis. I am a former school board member. I served for 22 years in the Tukwila School District and a past president of WASDA. And now I currently serve as the vice chair of the State Board of Education. Um, and ditto everything Amy already said. Um, so let's just go ahead and dive in. Great. Thanks, Mary. So first of all, let's look at, and hopefully y'all can read this okay. Sometimes we're accessing Zoom from our phone, but this is a definition of what a school board, a school superintendent does that is from the Federal Department of Education. So I thought it'd be really helpful to first to explain Yes, it is a really complicated job that superintendents do. They have to be operational managers. They have to be instructional leaders to help improve um, instruction within the district and lead that effort, as well as really, frankly, politicians. As, our, as you all know, our public schools are so dependent on passing levies. And um, if we're so lucky, bonds within our local communities being able to do that effectively is really um, a main part of a of a superintendent's job that varies into politics a bit, as well as um, co working with colleagues in the region and across the state. So it, it's a very complicated job that a superintendent does, which is why having time and energy to focus on the process of evaluating a superintendent's work is really important. And something I want to acknowledge here before we go too much farther, first of all, um, I'm sure you've thought about this, or if you came to board boot camp, we talked about this in many ways. You know, you all came on board as school board members in the middle of a school year. So a lot of processes were already kicked off. The budget process was already kicked off. You know, the set calendar for the school board was already set. And something that was already kicked off as well was the superintendent process. That is usually tied to um, either a, um, sometimes a calendar year, sometimes it starts in January in some districts I've seen, but most districts I've seen kick it off in the summer before school year starts. So more likely than not, you already have a process underway. And so it's really good to acknowledge that, that we're going to give you a bunch of information, but really the primary resource you should do is go to your own policies, go to your board colleagues, go to you, your president or chair of your board, who usually is tasked with coordinating this process and get a good understanding of how it looks and feels in your district. But let's talk, let's talk more about the background, really just to help ground it. But there's many ways, many reasons why a board needs to evaluate their superintendent. First off, we always want to start with the students, but there is research and actually several 
um, significant research um, papers that show that having a strong, focused and growth mind growth mindset oriented superintendent evaluation process leads to positive student outcomes. So it really is not something that you're doing just to check a couple boxes. It does uh, impact students. Also, um, it can, when done well, strengthen the board superintendent relationship. So it can help increase understanding of what the board expects from the superintendent. It can help the board understand what the superintendent needs in terms of resources and supports and processes and sometimes time in order to accomplish that. Um, and when done well, you know, in a professional way and in a way that can be honest and with open communications, it really does firm up that relationship. It's also part of the district's accountability to the public. So the school board has um, has an obligation to let the district, the community of the district know um, how the district is doing. And this is a really important part of that. And by having a process um, that is clear um, that's not overly complicated um, and that, again, acknowledges that accountability to the public. It can build trust with stakeholders. Again, around those very important times, like when it's time to pass a levy, this process can help support that trust. Um, and let's not forget that every employee in education um, deserves a really strong and supportive professional development aspect of their job. And so the board's role as, as supporting their employee um, it, having the evaluation support the superintendent's own professional development um, is a really important way that the board can help support student outcomes in their community. And lastly, there's actually a very specific law. Um, RCW stands, if you don't know, a revised code of Washington. It's an actual law citation here um, that it is a legal requirement to evaluate a superintendent and to have a process to do that. So by doing it, um, it, it, and with all the right reasons, you are actually um, complying with law as well. So I'm gonna hand it over to Mary to talk about um, some of the process aspects. Thank you, Amy. Amy. So Amy was uh, talking as uh, the framework for the why a board does this. And now we're gonna dive in a little bit as to how the board um, conducts the evaluation and why this is important um, because this also is impactful for what your final outcome is. So there's several considerations to take in mind when building your process to ensure that you've got um, leadership excellence built into it. So um, for those of you who've done some training with WASDA, uh, this should be familiar to you that we look talk in terms of cycles for a lot of the things that we do because there are overlapping responsibilities, roles and responsibilities between uh, the board and the superintendent that uh, complement each other. So um, what you're trying to do um, in this, you can, starting at the top, looking at what the board does with setting vision and goals, um, understanding what your student context is, uh, which is why you are locally elected board members, um, having a plan that monitoring piece that is built into much of the board's work and its different responsibilities, and then that reflection and review piece. Um, and so having a formal evaluation process allows you to provide uh, feedback through this cycle. And it's also uh, intended to be something that's taking place throughout the year where you're getting updates with that um, monitoring um, and reflection and review. Uh, and so, and this should end up strengthening the overall cycle as, as the district conducts its work. And if the superintendent evaluation process is often a silo by itself, it can cause several things. It can be a, a waste of your time and theirs. It can work against your objectives and uh, it can confuse the superintendent and your organization as to what the actual priorities are. Amy? So let's now let's think about another aspect is about how the evaluation is conducted. And this is grounded in a little bit of human resource and, and psychological research. Um, it's really important for the, the board to set a tone and an expectation around 
this process that, that they realize sets the tone throughout the organization. And um, we're, we're kind of Adam Grant geeks here in leadership development. So I pulled up an Adam Grant quote here about growth is not just the genius about the genius you possess, but it's about the character you develop. So having a process um, that is really grounded in a growth mindset, not only helps your relationship with the superintendent, but will trickle down. It's really important to think about that. So sometimes, um, it, you know, it's, it's, and then this is not just in school boards, but there's a lot of workplace environments where sometimes there'll be kind of a got you evaluation, you know, where, you, you know, some people are think it's the right thing to do to try to stump someone during an evaluation or try to do a military style thumbs up or thumbs down or, um, come up with kind of subjective evaluation technique. Um, I'd like to say this wasn't an actual example, but sometimes there's been superintendents evaluated on their hair or their dress. Um, and that's, it's not going to help students or the, the culture of the organization to do something like that. And so, and not only are you not focusing on student outcomes when you're having a process like that, um, it actually um, will, will, like I said, be pretty ineffective and it'll spread just this tone of unease and sometimes mistrust throughout the organization. So, but I want to really pull back here a little bit and acknowledge this can be a challenging thing to do. Let's, let's be honest here. There's a lot of pressures that school boards are under right now. There's a lot of pressures that superintendents are under and that can really constrain a conversation. Um, also, when we're evaluating a superintendent, it's important to evaluate on factors such as leadership skills, such as community engagement. And for some people evaluating, that can feel very subjective, which can then lead to sometimes a, an inefficient process. And also, don't forget, we are a, a board of five individuals, even though we have to come up with one evaluation process in the end, but we have five different backgrounds. We have five different work experience, and we might come to it with a lens that is um, sometimes challenging to, to coalesce around having a, a single process. So for that reason, there's a couple of questions here that you might want to think about, and I know that... Um, Tricia and Christine sent out a copy of this PowerPoint. So you'll get, you don't have to worry about taking these notes, you'll get these. But these are just some grounding questions that will help set up a really productive growth mindset process. Checking in with your superintendents before the process starts, what are their expectations, what would be helpful for them in their professional development, and also taking time to discuss it as a board. Again, taking those five, um, five lenses and try to coalesce them into one in order to keep the gears of the district moving really well. And again, just pointing out, y'all joined in the middle most likely of the process. So, you know, reach out to your board chair or president to see what those conversations were previously. That would help you get, um, get some more background. And then also if it's very common for, um, superintendent evaluations to really get detailed around this time of year, April, May, June. So there'll be more likely than not meetings where you'll have time set aside to talk about process and be able to have questions like this. Okay, Mary. Thanks, Amy. So um, as being a uh, in the role of the governance role of being a board member, the word accountability shows up a lot. Uh, and one of the things that we need to re uh, remind ourselves about is that accountability is two directional. Uh, it does not flow uh, just one way. And so thinking about your evaluation process in terms of that two-way accountability, that this is a way for both the superintendent and the board to get feedback um, and that because we want to be seeing that, that uh, growth is happening both for the board um, and the superintendent and the way they interact with each other and as well as being able to identify what kinds of supports um, that are needed to get there. Uh, and it's a benefit to everyone when we're focusing on the growth side um, and looking at how superintendents can serve students. Uh, and then the board's part of this is creating the process that's easy for both the public to understand, um, as well as uh, setting clear expectations that the superintendent is working towards. And as, as has been mentioned, uh, you do have a legal obligation to do this evaluation um, uh, uh, on a yearly basis. So um, in looking at the that process, um, 
going to read something from our Washington Standards-Based Superintendent Evaluation Tool, which you can find on the WASDA website, and it's really we'll be talking about it a little bit uh, more in depth, but a, a great um, option uh, to consider or at least have a conversation around. Um, but it, the comment that we put in there is uh, a strong evaluation system provides a way for the board to be accountable to the greater community and the students, plus support the superintendent. So when we look at these um, uh, bullet points, the, the process has to support the fact the outcome is one evaluation, not five. Remember, you're a governance body, not individuals. And so this needs, whatever uh, system you use, it needs to be presented as a, a one, not um, individual, um, ind not five individuals looking at it. And the board chair is the person who's responsible for guiding that process, but all board members um, have a role in participating and supporting that effort. Um, there's lots of different ways to do this. Um, sometimes people look at scoring, um, you know, a, a one to five. Um, are there um, outliers that might be showing up in some of the, if you're using a rating system uh, like that? I know on, on my board, if we were using at different times a rating system, because we had an evolution of this process over the years, uh, one of the things was if somebody was uh, listing either a one or a five, that they needed to have an explanation that went with that. Um, so that, again, making it clear, because both of those were extremes on not meeting expectations or exceeding expectations. And so it was important to have some clarity around that. Uh, some people have the superintendent in uh, the, the meeting, in the room with them as scoring is happening. Others don't. Um, if they're not there, then this again needs to be a conversation happening where the board's providing their input. The superintendent has time to take a look at it, process it, ask questions, you know, getting back together again. Again, this needs to be a two-way piece. Uh, and what we want to avoid is having um, a, a checklist um, that you're this is, should really be um, an informative conversation. And it's also important when we look at uh, accountability that your your superintendent has a re should have a reasonable expectation that the board is going to be su uh, providing supports to be successful. So the one side of the accountability is the board saying, "Here are our expectations or our goals for you." Now, if I'm the superintendent, I uh, should have a reasonable expectation that you're going to provide me with the resources and supports to actually achieve what you're asking me to do. Um, and uh, if the board is not, if that involves some budgetary decisions and you're not uh, providing that, then we're not setting anybody up for success. And then um, the, the process should be achievable without excessive demands. Um, we did not provide our superintendent with a long list of goals for them to meet. There were things we had that were very specific um, and tied to our strategic plan so that um, they could really focus. And the thing that's also helpful is, you know, you want to have the conversation about whether this evaluation is working for all of you. And um, so that needs to be a mutual conversation. Um, if I were me, probably any of us on this call, we would want to have some say in what is being used to evaluate us. And saying that really helpful if you've got similar criteria um, for several years so that you can actually monitor whether growth is happening and be able to have that apples to apples comparison. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and again, we've talked about the fact that this is a legal obligation, ethical and professional. Uh, and the, the uh, we really want to be uh, looking at how we can make this as objective and transparent uh, um, as, po as possible. Uh, professional is a word that probably it would be a good idea to define what that means for your board because that can be a subjective term. And as Amy mentioned earlier, there have been uh, times when a superintendent's been evaluated on how they dress or what kind of hairstyle they have. And that is um, something you need to be really careful about because uh, that means something different to different people. And what you've really hired is an instructional leader. Um, and how are they doing with these essential skills that you want them to be uh, having as they're uh, doing the work? Uh, you, and again, there are, there are some ramifications for not doing either the legal, the ethical, or the professional 
uh, pieces of this, you could expose the district to some to lawsuits. Uh, you, if you are trying to terminate a superintendent, that can come up sometimes, and they haven't been properly evaluated. Uh, you could uh, be on the hook for uh, some type of payout that can be pretty significant, um, since most superintendents tend to have a, a three-year contact uh, contract as a base. And it can also uh, cause some strife within your organization and the community because you're going to be limited in the things that you can say. Uh, you've got to keep some things confidential uh, and that can then have some ramifications also. So the best tip we can give you with, uh, with this is you know, do your research, plan ahead. Uh, if there's questions that you have, don't hesitate to reach out to uh, WASDA and or to your district's legal counsel. Next slide, please. And then there's executive session. Um, and this we have to be really, really cognizant of. Um, I would also encourage you if you don't have the latest copy of the Open Public Meetings Act, OPMA, the guidebook that WASTA has, that has been updated. And uh, uh, there's a, a big section on executive session there on and what's appropriate and what's not. So we've just pulled the piece uh, specific for this conversation today. Uh, and it is permitted for you to have an, a notice an executive session for planning and discussion around the superintendent evaluation, but you may not take any kind of vote um, about anything related to the, the contract uh, in that executive session. This is something that must be done in the open uh, public meeting, in the business meeting, uh, and a reminder also that we are not to be making agreements or promises uh, to the superintendent or to our fellow board members uh, in within executive session. Right. So now, so we talked about why it's important to do it, what can be the benefits of doing it, especially investing the time and creating a process for it. We talked about other considerations about how to create your process and how to conduct the evaluation. So now we're going to talk about some tools and processes and, and some things to keep in mind to support this work. Again, this is one of our major responsibilities as school board members, and it can take a lot of time. Uh, but it's well worth it. But luckily, you don't have to invent things from scratch. So we want to talk to you about a couple of frameworks that are out there. They could be very well be one that your district's already employing. So this will just give you a little background on them. So first of all, within that link to the um, WASDA webpage on superintendent evaluation, you will find this um, system that a lot of districts in the state use. It's called a standards-based system. So it's based off of um, some very thorough work examining standards around best practices for a superintendent's role and work within a district. So this work was um, conducted several years ago. A lot of people got together and researched um, what should comprise within this tool. And so it actually, if, if you have an education background or you're familiar with the, the education um, evaluation model for teachers, it actually kind of looks and feels the same as that, which can be helpful for educators and sometimes even the broader community to understand. And it comes with a rubric. So the idea is not only do you get the standards of, of what um, a superintendent should be doing, but also there are is a chart like you'll see here that we took a screenshot of that tells you what different um, practices look like um, in terms of growth um, with having good, um, good work and in-depth work around these practices. So the um, thing to keep in mind about this is that it is a very in-depth tool. In fact, it's so in-depth that often a school board will have conversations with their superintendent and not evaluate on every standard every year. They'll come up with a schedule and divide them up amongst different years, probably based off of what is in the context of their district at the time. Perhaps they need to do some new curriculum development and so they would lean a little bit more on the instructional standards. Maybe there's a levy coming up. There'd be a little bit more on the community engagement standards. So using the context of your district would help um, guide that conversation of which standards to focus on when. But um, the onus is on the superintendent to start bringing evidence of their work within these standards. And so doing every single standard 
for the superintendent to gather evidence of work in every single standard would just take up so much of their time that they just do not have. And so that's why a lot of districts have gone to the fact that they only do a couple every year. Another tool is uh, what we've been uh, calling an outcomes-based uh, evaluation process. And this centers the district strategic plan um, as what you're working around. And the important thing about this is that if you are in a district with a strategic plan, it is intended to be your roadmap for three to five years. And so it would be appropriate uh, for the superintendent's goals as well as a lot of the board's goals to be uh, aligned with what is happening in each year of the district strategic plan, uh, because you're supposed to be uh, allocating resources to support each year. Uh, the there are things for in the plan that with the action items that are going to be taking place in different years, and so this actually provides a really great roadmap for the evaluation process because you do want to be measuring, are we accomplishing the things that we've set out to do in each year of the, the district strategic plan? Um, there is a, um, we've got some guiding principles available on the WASDA website and you can look forward to uh, a comprehensive tool um, that's going to be released at some point this year uh, to, to help support this. Uh, the, the, the nice thing about this outcomes-based piece is that it's a really clear, easy thing for your community to, to follow for the board. It really helps with some of the decision-making. Again, things all working together around that plan because most plans have maybe four to five different categories, uh, whether it's operations, teaching and learning, uh, community engagement, uh, student, staff, well-being, you know, things like this uh, that make it easy to surface goals within each that that can be um, targeted. And so what this means is that whatever your strategic plan looks like, because these also vary by district, that you you will have to be having that conversation for a well-defined way to review your progress against those goals. And then also to be able to uh, review the superintendent's work in related to student goals and within the operations of the district. Great. And then one more tool we want to talk about is how evaluation works in a policy governance system. So policy governance is a structured governance model. And just to back up a little bit, a governance model is a set of policies that have been created in order to help guide not only just school districts and school board policy, but actually um, policy governance is a framework that's used in several nonprofit organizations and for-profit business for those board of directors to help, instead of their superintendent, their CEO, help set expectations, help set roles, help set rules, help set practices to guide the work and really create a, a very delineated um, and well-explained um, framework for understanding what the superintendent's responsible for, what this board of directors responsible for, and how they're going to work together in order to achieve the overall mission um, and strategic goals often of a district. So there are several districts in Washington state, my district happens to be one of them, that uses a policy governance structure in order to conduct the board's work and how the board and the superintendent interact. So it, within policy governance, there aren't necessarily individual annual board goals or superintendent goals. Um, what this, the strategic plan is often used as a framework, just kind of like what Mary was talking about with that model. This is another way of using a, super, a strategic plan goal framework in order to think of how progress is done. And so literally within policy governance, the performance of how the district is doing is equating to how the performance of the superintendent is doing. So one reason why um, my district invented, invested several years, honestly, in order to move to policy governance, we found the clarification of what the board's expectation was around the superintendent's work to be very helpful and helped eliminate some gray areas. And so 
um, what happens is during the year, the um, superintendent has to give reports, not only on the strategic goals, but actually various operational policies that are within policy governance models. And as those reports are given throughout the year, a document is taken where um, board members will first vote on whether or not they find the superintendent in compliance with the policy. And then they, um, the board takes a minute to write down their notes and thoughts on a response document. And those are all um, held on to throughout the year so that when it's time to do a superintendent evaluation at the end of the year, you have a whole year's worth of reports and data that evidence has already been collected by the superintendent and presented to the board. The board's thoughts in the moment, you don't have to try to remember in May what was discussed in October. So what the board's thoughts were in the moment and the reflections and the feedback given in the moment are documented. And so you bring it to the meeting in May um, the board reflects upon it and then gives an annual summative evaluation for the superintendent. So um, what you'll want to do is if you have a policy governance structure, you know, it's something to check on within your district. There are, of course, um, some slight differences. This I've kind of explained the overall structure of how superintendent evaluation works within policy governance. Of course, every school board has the option of creating policies in whatever way. And so you'll want to check in again with your board chair and with the rest of your colleagues to see how that structure was framed. Look up your policies to see how it's been delineated out. Um, and then you'll be able to be able to step into that. And more often than not, if you are a policy governance, you've had a couple monitoring reports because you've been in the seat for a couple months now. So that's how superintendent evaluation works within policy governance. So we've kind of given you a, a very quick um, broad brush fire hose version of three different uh, types of uh, tools to do your uh, evaluation. So we wanted to pull together from these models, some common themes with, where it doesn't matter which one you're doing, but these are elements that you want to be uh, considering when you're doing your process. Um, as we've mentioned, your strategic plan is a critical tool that can be used. Uh, and in that cycle of uh, leadership that we were talking about and monitoring and reviewing, if you are reviewing a, a category or an element of your strategic plan every month, you are creating that um, conversation and documentation to help know how you and your superintendent are moving forward in uh, accomplishing the goals for the plan that year. And it does some of your collection of uh, evidence that you'd be using or information for the process along the way, which makes it much easier for everyone um, as you're, you're looking through. Uh, what does your superintendent uh, contract say? Uh, are you positive uh, and feeling solid that the process that you're using is in alignment with uh, the superintendent's current contract. If there are dates in there, these need to be um, honored and making sure you're on top of that. Uh, is there some type of a process that is included in uh, the contract? You would wanna make sure that you're in alignment there also. Uh, the uh, Looking at your superintendent's job description uh, things can evolve over time, uh, and that might be reflected in the things that are coming up as priorities as you're doing the evaluation. But again, make sure that um, you know it's a it's a good reminder. What did we originally post uh, for what our expectations were, what we were looking for? How might that have evolved? And having that intentional conversation around it so that uh, again, everyone's expectations and understanding is in alignment. Doing the calendar uh, for predictability, transparency, and accuracy. Uh, this should not be a summative one-time conversation. It should be conversations that you've scheduled throughout the year as a check-in. Um, just think about if you're going to be evaluated in uh, an organization, you would not want to come in uh, once a year to say, hey, this is what we're evaluating you on and not be able to have that opportunity to have a check in, see how things are going, what kind of adjustments might need to be made. Uh, you know, when uh, people were in the middle of the uh, or coming up in the spring of the evaluation process, when the pandemic hit and a whole lot of pivoting and things had to to shift. So, you know, understand that you do what you need to do in this in the 
situation that you're in and uh, we need to be doing some regrounding and making sure that we we've got things uh, where they need to be um and then how going back to that strategic plan piece when you're doing that kind of calendaring with the update that can feed into this calendar of pieces of this process that uh, you you're going to be looking at depending on what the the goals and expectations on are on um, how you're, um, you know, it, this can be time consuming. So some of the things we're suggesting are giving you ways to do checkpoints throughout the year that assist with this so that it isn't a, a big uh, piece of time at the, the end of the year. Um, looking at focusing on the long term growth of the district is a really a good way as you're looking at um, what kinds of outcomes you want to see. And just because you're doing well on something doesn't mean that you should be continuing to focus on it to sustain sustain those good practices. Things that you're doing well, there's effort and resources that were put into that. It doesn't happen by accident. So what needs to happen to be able to continue that um, for your district? When you look at the, the, this is also then related to whatever the context of your district is. We have 295. Uh, and so there are different things that are of importance to you and different things that you might want to be focusing on. Um, and that's important to, again, be intentional about recognizing that and, and the, the reality of what you're working on. Where, um, what, where are you um, doing some planning? You know, thinking ahead about what should this look like, not just the process of people filling things out and doing whatever kind of rating, whatever kind of comments you've had, but plan for the what's going to happen in the executive session that you're going to be holding, um, making sure that it's legal, uh, that you have uh, done exactly what needs to be done, which would be under the category of going into an executive session for purposes of evaluating uh, a public employee. Uh, so that the kind of thing that you announce, what are the things that can and can't be discussed, ensuring that everyone's clear about that so that uh, you are able to do the board's business without concerns about any kind of violation of the Open Public Meetings Act. Uh, and then um, we really want to be foundationally, again, uh, reminding ourselves that the, this evaluation is not intended to be a gotcha uh, that doesn't serve anyone well. Um, I know I wouldn't want to be treated that way, um, and probably many of you have, as part of your operating principles, if you have those either in policy or as a, a agreements with your board, uh, no surprises, because uh, that, again, that doesn't serve anyone well, and it does not support trust building and consensus building. So uh, again, this should be uh, in its best form a uh, conversation and uh, being able to help under, uh, be able to act as one voice, as one evaluation, not uh, an evaluation of five as our final product. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mary. I know I always try to imagine what it would be like to have five bosses and get five different evaluations. That would That would be a challenge. That would be a challenge. But yeah, if you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A. There is a question in here, Mary, that I think you would be great to answer. So, um, in, and I'll just read it out loud for everyone. So our new superintendent created a strategic plan without direction of the board, then came to the board to create a mission statement based on that plan and the vision which was created by students. As a new member of the board, I wonder how the board can influence the plan to reflect the evaluation process. Wow, okay, there's a lot in that question. There is. <laughs> um, so I will, uh, take a shot at this um because I have thoughts and I'm trying to pull them together here uh so one of the things about a strategic plan that probably should be um maybe one of your foundational uh conversations about that uh around that is um and now the question has disappeared as I'm trying oh it's under answered it's under answered okay yeah. all right um it's a strategic plan should is one of those things that should be created with a lot of input from board and community, including students, because it's one of the things that should be a part of that are what are the core values of your organization and the core values uh, 
th that's a really powerful conversation to be having. And usually from that, what flows out from it is your, uh, what you want to be considering as your mission and your vision, um, as well as what the, the focus areas are. Uh, I think that's awesome that there was student involvement uh, and engagement in this process, since they are the people who are ultimately uh, the most impacted by uh, what this this is. But I, it sounds like it this might be something that uh, would be helpful uh, for scheduling as a conversation uh, with the board as an agenda item or as either, or maybe perhaps a study session. Because since the strategic plan is something that's going to be guiding the district, I don't um, knew, know if it's a three to five year uh, one. And as a new board member, you're still getting up to speed on the context and the process and what went into it. This might be helpful um, to be able to provide that space to get some of that context and then be uh, able to have a conversation around what a, a mission statement might look like. And remember, even though there's a plan in place, uh, it's going to shift over time. Um, and that's why you have regular conversations about it and doing monitoring. Uh, there may be some things that you're able to do faster than you thought, which means other goals and action plans might move up uh, in the plan. And the converse can happen too. Things can totally unexpected the pandemic in the middle of, you know, while well, you're doing it and, and you're going to have to readjust and some things are then going to have to take uh, longer. The point is that you're having the conversation about it and that you have a process through your calendaring, through the tool of your board meetings, agendas, and works uh, study sessions uh, to be able to talk about that. Um, and this is, it is in the board's wheelhouse, the, uh, the, top level of the strategic plan, which is core values, mission, vision, what the categories are, um, to be able to provide the framework for your staff to start that implementation process. And so that is, um, this is a, a, these are legitimate ways within the board's wheelhouse where you can influence that plan um, and then have a, a, night, a good conversation about what role do we want the plan to play in our evaluation process. Did I answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> long, but Mary, I, Mary, I might add a little bit to that too. Uh, you're right. This is a multi-layered question, and part of it is, you know, clearly some dissatisfaction with the board not being involved um, in the way that they might have liked in the strategic planning process. And I think you addressed that really well. So, how this might relate to um, this year's superintendent evaluation process is: this would be an opportunity for the board to share with the superintendent. You know, we we would like to have a, a more involved role in developing out um, some aspects of the strategic plan so that you are, as the superintendent, doing the work that aligns with uh, the work that the board wants to see within the district, too, but not necessarily using that superintendent evaluation um, meeting to develop them, like you said, doing so within a, a separate session. Amy, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, no, I think that's really helpful. And again, I, you know, there's obviously questions about the process, but again, I think it's important to to acknowledge the fact that as a new board members, we step into processes that have been underway. But that also means that um, board members can maybe ask for a pause in a study session to slow down and, and get that context and then help help pivot to to look forward to next steps. All right, there's another question. Oh, do, go ahead, Trisha. Did you have another thought? No, I you, I was going to go to the next question. You go ahead. No, well, and this one um, I want to help with because I was the one helping with monitoring reports. But when we talk about a calendar um, that supports a superintendent evaluation, it doesn't have to be just a, regarding monitoring reports within a policy governance structure. So depending on your policy around superintendent evaluation, depending on your contract with your superintendent, um, you'll want to take a look and again, have discussions all together, the board and the superintendent about how it might be helpful to schedule activities around superintendent evaluation throughout the year. Again, waiting, waiting till the very end to try to get a whole bunch of evidence in and have a very long meeting going through evidence when honestly work has been going on for the other several months. Um, it can make for a really laborsome process and you don't necessarily get the best information. So having a planning calendar, um, actually around a, 
we're, we're kind of in favor of board calendars in general. So not just around superintendent evaluations, but there's a whole bunch of reasons, you know, planning community engagement, interacting with students. There's, there's a whole bunch of ways that a calendar can help a board really do its work with fidelity. But um, sitting down, you, for example, there within a superintendent contract, sometimes there are um, clauses that say, okay, the board and the superintendent are gonna check in maybe January, early February. Um, to talk about whether or not um, the contract negotiation will be looking any different. Um, for example, if if a superintendent is um, is perhaps looking to advance their career or try a different opportunity, there's a clause in the contract to have this ver just a verbal check in, so that the board is knowing that the superintendent perhaps is looking for um, for new opportunities. So there, you know, look, that's just one example of why checking your contract can be really helpful. And then you can get that on a calendar and make sure that check-in happens. Any other thoughts around calendaring, Mary or Tricia? I'm just a big proponent of it because when you can be proactive like that, it, first of all, it does help with that cycle we were talking about with monitoring and evaluation, discussion, revision, et cetera. But also you have a lot, probably uh, most boards uh, and districts have a number of policies that say some version of this policy will be reviewed on an annual basis. So since your policies are the legal framework within which the board does its work, if it says it in there, you need to be doing it. Um, and that's a lot, that can be a lot to keep track of. So calendaring that review um, is ensuring that these things that are really important um, are happening. And then that allows the board to not feel like you're constantly reacting to things, but you're able to be proactive um, and staying on top of uh, some things that you've identified. It also is a good opportunity to say, you know, maybe we don't need to review that one every year, maybe every couple of years, you know, once you start seeing um, the um, the amount of, of things that you have committed yourself to. Um, so it calendaring is just, it's a it's a really helpful to, tool for everyone. And um, don't forget if there's things you're asking for, um, let's take that strategic plan piece. Um, if you wanna get an update on operations, for example, your staff knows um, if the people who would be responsible for doing that presentation, they have a lot of advance notice uh, knowing when they need to be prepared for that particular piece. So it's not just for the board, it's also a really great way to um, avoid surprises for your staff. I think they can probably tell we don't recommend surprises, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> you don't like them either. So yes, being very clear um, is one of the uh, great advantages of both the superintendent evaluation and um, also the board calendar. So there's one more question I see, and then we'll wrap it up for today. Is it typical to renew a superintendent's contract each year? So it's always three years out. Mary, Amy, do you want to take that? Um, I would say in Washington, it has become a, a norm. It's, um, I think I was, like I said, I was on my board for 22 years, going back a couple of, when I got on the board, that was um, kind of the standard. Uh, there isn't anything uh, that I'm aware of that is a legal obligation for you to do that. It is one of those things that has um, evolved to that being the way it is. Now, there are some uh, results of that. Uh, a board can, for lots of different reasons, decide they not they don't want to extend, they're renewing the contract, but they're not extending it for the third year. But out in public, because this has been a, a, a fairly long-standing um, way things are, are done, it can convey a message that is not at all what the board is intending. Now, in some cases, people will think, oh, they didn't extend the third year, there's uh, some issues there that, uh, and maybe the superintendent is, um, uh, needs to be looking for, for something else there. But again, I said, there's, there's perceptions and then there's reality. Uh, so uh, if you're going to engage in that, then just being aware of that, that there might need to be some proactive communication around why the board is, um, taking the action that it is. Um, and sometimes there might not be. And then 
again, perception is reality. And uh, just you need to know this is a context question around what is considered quote unquote normal. Uh, and as soon as you vary from that, then you can just expect that there might be questions. And I'm uh, very interested in what Tricia or Amy might want to add to that. Yeah, let, let me add that um, in many cases, for those of you, it is a legal obligation because it can be found in your superintendent's contract. Um, most superintendent contracts within the state of Washington, as Mary indicated, um, do indicate that um, it's a what they call a three-year rolling contract. So at any given time, a superintendent has their contract rolled over for one more year, always having that third year. So, and, and that brings me just to the idea of co superintendent contracts in general. Um, that's another really valuable um, uh, piece of information for you to have as you are um, beginning the superintendent evaluation, because you want to ensure that all of the things that are required of you as the board in that employment contract are followed. Amy, do you have any last moments before we, or mentions before we wrap up? No, I'll just say ditto. Okay. That's yeah. a good way to do it. Well, we will give these folks three minutes back in their lunch hour. And um, I'll just remind you, I've dropped a lot of links into the chat box as we've gone along. Um, yeah, there are a number of um, learning opportunities for you coming up. Those can be found on the webpage as well. Um, and then by tomorrow, both a copy of the PowerPoint that you saw today, as well as a recording of this webinar will be up on that new director network. So you are welcome to use those for your own um, knowledge and, and reference, as well as forward those to other folks. So um, Amy, Mary, just want to thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your many years of knowledge around superintendent evaluations. And I want to thank all of you for attending today. Have a wonderful Tuesday.